You are watching programming from the East West Center in Washington, D.C. Well, good afternoon from Washington, D.C., and good day to you wherever you are and at whatever time we find you. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure today to have you with us for a program that I think you will find extremely exciting. It's part of our series uh, called 60 Minutes for the East-West Center's 60th Anniversary. And as the name of the series indicates, it brings back uh, very distinguished and accomplished alumni who have been engaged in issues related to U.S.-Asia relations and regional issues. And I can think of no one finer to close out our series. Uh, this is the last of the series uh, through this end of this month, and then we will take a brief hiatus and return after the elections. Uh, and, and the program today is with Professor uh, Saori Katada on Japan's geoeconomic strategy in the Asia Pacific. Uh, Saori is a, a professor of international relations at USC and um, uh, was a fellow with us in 2015. And we have stayed very much in touch over the years since she has been a fellow in our Washington office of the East West Center. And uh, she has uh, contributed throughout the, this time, both when she was here and since. And we're also delighted to have with us our senior advisor and fellow of the East West Center, Dr. Ellen Frost. As many of you know, Ellen Frost has had a long and distinguished career in the US government in a variety of uh, departments and agencies, and also is an accomplished academic herself, having uh, written books on US-Japan relations, on regional rivalrism, uh, regional multilateral institutions. So I can't think of a more formidable pair to consider uh, the future of Japan's role in the region and what that might uh, mean for the United States. Obviously, this is a critical time, not only the election, but a change in um, uh, leadership in Japan with Prime Minister Abe stepping down and the former cabinet secretary, Mr. Suga, now prime minister just this week being in Vietnam and Indonesia. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's some questions on the Japanese end on terms of where does the new prime minister go? What is the outlook for the continued efforts of Japan have been made over the last decade? And of course, as we go to our elections, what this might mean for the US-Japan relationship and for the region as a whole. So welcome, uh, you know the ground rules, we're live, we're YouTube streaming. So I will take questions and read them. And the only purpose of that is that way our two distinguished speakers don't have to uh, bother with that. I can uh, feed them questions as they arise and maybe accumulate and bunch them up as might be useful to them. Um, and also because our YouTube live stream folks cannot see the question. So it's useful to, to state them before uh, asking uh, Sauri and Ellen uh, to respond. With that, welcome. Let us use the time for their brilliance. Sauri Katada, please. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Satu. Um, before I share this, well, let me just, maybe it's probably a better way to share the screen first. And I hope you don't mind my PowerPoint. Um, there you go. So it is really an honor to be invited to this uh, 60 minutes for the East West Center 60th anniversary event, 6060, <laughs> wonderful naming. Um, I was a fellow there at, in Washington DC office uh, in the, the fall of 2015. So it's been five years already. But it's a special time for me because actually the book, the book, this book that I'm presenting today, uh, started started. Well, I was I started writing this book. Yes, thank you. <laughs> um, in the uh, in the time when I was the fellow there, so this was a really exciting time actually when uh, TPP was uh, basically agreed and uh, it, uh, AIIB, the Asian Invest uh, Infrastructure Investment. Uh, Bank was kind of emerging and so on. So this was really a kind of a special time that I spent there. And it was a time when I could spend time away from my teaching, it really helped me a lot. So I, you know, the East West Center has a very special place in my heart as well as in this book. So let me talk, start talking about this by putting Prime Minister Abe's face. Uh, this is the first page, the headline of the Wall Street Journal from March 9th, 2018. So this was a time when CPTPP, which is a TPP without the United States, was uh, signed in Santiago, Chile. 
And this is the, the kind of a, a major headline to say that the Prime Minister Abe used to be the one uh, painted as somebody who was pushing back for, to, against liberal, like, trade liberalization, is now taking a really a prominent leadership in supporting the international liberal order by agreeing in this uh, mega trade agreement. At the same time, I think it has much more uh, more profound roots to talk about Japan as a trade villain, especially in the context of the United States uh, having a lot of trade conflict between between uh, the, in, with Japan from the 90s, well, sometimes 1970s, but a lot in 1980s into the mid first half of 1990s. So in some ways, it's really curious to see how Japan, which used to be such a, a entity that drugged its feet or, or very resistant to uh, entertain liberal economic order is now pushing forward towards that. And how did it happen? You know, what, in what ways had Japan transformed is the topic of my book. So just you know, start to kindly show it uh, to the, the audience too, but this is the a book just came out in July uh, from Columbia University Press. Um, in some ways, I would like to argue that one, Japan is still very, very important, especially so in the context of US-China rivalry going on in this uh, Asia-Pacific regional context and uncertainty of the international liberal order in, in this region overall, one. But at the same time, I think it came out at the very good timing where, as uh, Satu was already introducing, uh, Prime Minister Abe stepped down and thinking about where Japan can actually take this, uh, how, what kind of direction Japan is going from here. So the questions I'm asking is how has Japan become the savior of the international liberal economic order, which is the order that is open to trade and which has a rules-based uh, kind of order to promote a fluid exchange of free market uh, through investment, trade, and, and various uh, other means, uh, obviously led by the United States since 1945. And now we are seeing some of the, the kind of a detrimental impact of the US kind of receding from the, from the leadership position. Uh, so, um, and then think about then how and why Japan's uh, kind of geoeconomic strategy shifted and looking at from the late 1980s until now about the quarter century. And by, by looking at the, uh, looking through this, uh, thinking at the conclusion, I would like to discuss a bit about the opportunities and challenges that this Japanese government uh, faces in the new, this new geo-economic strategy. But I would like to argue here that Japanese government's liberal churn comes from Japan's economic, own economic maturity in the 21st century, but, but also it has taken advantage of this major rivalry of two giants, the United States and rise of China kind of created in the context of Asia Pacific. Especially this is important for the rule setting kind of strategy that Japan has started to take and now to some extent successfully implemented. At the same time though, these uh, transformation of Japanese uh, geoeconomic strategy has not been very smooth and uh, the domestic political economic structure of Japan actually shape, shapes a unique path in kind of a different path that specific strategies has taken in specific issue areas. So that's the basic kind of uh, uh, structure of my book. But let me start discussing from the kind of a lot of chapters first in terms of how this regional geoeconomic strategy has taken place. And I would like to call that as a common direction, but also a diverse path. Defining uh, Japan's regional uh, geoeconomic strategy is probably first thing I have to put in on, on the table. Uh, the definition of it is the useful use of economic instruments by the government in order to achieve national goals. And for Japan, the national goals in the context of the Asia Pacific is to secure regional environment, economic environment especially, uh, in favor of Japan's economic activities. Um, there are a lot of problems that kind of a, a struggle with Japan's economy in transforming uh, in terms of you know, many challenges like demography, debt, and, and so on and so forth. It is important for Japan to be able to cultivate the region as a, a beneficial platform for Japanese economic activities. And so that's the kind of a foundation of Japan's geoeconomic strategy. 
the interesting part of this is that Japan engaged with the region earlier too, 1970s, 1980s, Japan was a major entity uh, kind of uh, involved in uh, economic relations with this region. But the way that it engaged was quite different from the, the current one. And that's the old style, I call it, of strategy, where the structure of the relationship was bilateral and uh, mode of engagement was very informal. So legal st strategy was never taken. And also this was uh, in pursuit of, so underlying value of it was the in pursuit of embedded mercantilism. So mercantilism of trying to export as much as possible, gain a lot of uh, trade surplus vis-a-vis -vis the partner was a really crucial part. And obviously that applied to the United States too. Meanwhile, in the 20, 25 years kind of forward, uh, the way that Japan is taking is a totally different strategy, which I call state-led liberal strategy. Uh, I see quite a, a significant uh, kind of transformation in place by the late 1990s, but much more so in the 21st century, where the mode of uh, the structure of engagement is very regional and institutional building is really important part of it. And also a mode of engagement is very formal. It relies on some of the legal agreement, the treaties and free trade agreement and so on and so forth. And the value underlining it is a pursuit of liberal, uh, liberal order as well as kind of a high global standard. So uh, overall, that's the, the overall shift I am looking into. The general shift is common across different issue areas of economics while uh, the path that it has taken is uh, quite diverse. I will cover today because of the time limitation are only one issue area, which is trade and investment, which is chapter five, where I talk about the gradual path. And uh, there are two other chapters, which I introduced very briefly, uh, following this, the money and finance chapter, as well as the uh, uh, foreign aid and development, but they took a very different kind of a path, though, again, to the common direction. So in the context of trade and investment, the old strategy was, again, significant dominance of bilateralism. Obviously, we've heard a lot of, you know, maybe some audience are young, young to not know, but, you know, all of us, Satu, Evan, and myself, are observers of the Japan-US trade conflict over the past you know, the 1970s, 80s, and 1990s. And also Japan has engaged many of the Asian nations as well as China in a kind of bilateral manner. It is interesting, the insightful story about the APEC uh, in actually as late as 1997, Japan was the, uh, the, the entity that strongly opposed their liberalization, trade liberalization effort in the name of uh, early voluntary sectoral liberalization. And because of that, that initiative failed. Japan totally did want it to do with nothing to do with that kind of uh, legalistic push towards economic liberalization. Meanwhile, the, the, since then, the new um, strategy started to, to come into place. And as I mentioned, this was a very gradual kind of uh, uh, evolution of that strategy from starting from relatively small bilateral free trade agreement, uh, Japan calls it EPA, which is Economic Partnership Agreements, and then kind of uh, capturing some of the uh, trade, uh, sorry, investment side by the three member uh, investment agreement between China and Korea, South Korea and Japan, and then gradually expanding. Uh, let me just show this picture from the Minister of Economy and Trade and Industry. This is uh, unfortunately last year's uh, white paper. I, they haven't translated the, this year's yet. But anyway, uh, this kind of shows how far Japan has gotten from 2002, which was the first uh, free trade agreement uh, with a very small country I, without much agriculture, which is Singapore. And now it you know, almost covers 80% of Japan's trade by expanding its, uh, its uh, uh, partners and members of economic partnership agreement, free trade agreement, uh, of, you know, one of which is a TPP, uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership. The other big one is the one with EU. Uh, very recent, well, so RT, RCEP, which is the pink one at the bottom, this one, 
is about to conclude uh, this year, hopefully, that, that's what I've been hearing. And also recently, I think just today or yesterday, Japan concluded uh, agreement with the uh, uh, East, with, uh, United Kingdom to have its uh, free, trade, free trade agreement. So just to get back a little bit. So these formal rules of free trade agreement as well as uh, investment is coming into place. And now the standard with TPP and, and agreement with EU, you can observe very high liberal standard, even though Japan protects some part of agriculture, but still the coverage of the free trade is quite significant. So this has been a long way for Japan to come. Uh, especially Japan's shining moment came in from 2017 to 2018. In 2017, this was a time when Trump said no to TPP. Uh, this was the first order of his business, basically. Three days after his, uh, his team coming into the office, he took the uh, US out from the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement, which is the mega agreement, which would have covered 40% of the global GDP, uh, to, uh, you know, out, uh, US out from it. Uh, Japan was shocked, uh, you know, in many ways, uh, even though it was anticipated already. But you know, after a few months of kind of, str kind of uh, uh, brainstorming and you know, kind of struggling, actually, Japan took the lead along with countries like Australia and New Zealand uh, to agree on the member 11 member uh, free trade agreement uh, called C uh, Comprehensive Progressive Agreement of uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership, CPTPP or TPP 11. So this was uh, in the in the words of uh, former ambassador, U.S. ambassador to Japan, uh, 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 um, Ambassador Shifa. This was really one of the really breakthrough for Japan's uh, foreign economic policy, really going against the U.S. Uh, but you know, kind of taking a significant lead. Um, some other chapters, the two other chapters, money and finance, this was the, the kind of evolution which was quite uneven in nature, just to kind of say one word about it. Uh, they, Japan actually was quite successful uh, establishing Chenmai Initiative, which is now multilateralized, and bond, ish, bond market has grown tremendously with the support of Japan in the last uh, 20 years, while the currency issue hasn't really progressed as much. Meanwhile, foreign aid and development, obviously also Japan has taken a very significant lead, especially in the context of G20 Osaka summit, which took place uh, about a year and a half in 19, uh, sorry, 2019, where G20 principle of, uh, principles for the quality infrastructure investment was agreed under Japanese leadership. So also this also kind of represent Japan's uh, liberal push to uh, to put in place the high global standard in the area of uh, development and foreign aid. So the main question here is so why? How did it happen or what the what are the foundation of it? The uh, chapter three is the chapter where I looked at the shifting uh, geoeconomic balance, uh, the kind of economic balance between uh, Japan and China in East Asia. Uh, obviously, Japan captured very significant part of the regional economy you know, back in the 1980s, you know, 65, 70%, while China was still uh, really uh, kind of you know, even there not to catch up yet, while over the course of the next 20 years, that balance uh, kind of tipped towards, towards China. At the same time, though, it is important to note that it's not only the kind of balance, but, but there is a significant regional integration going on where Japan is integrated, not only you know, integrated uh, through the region, you know, investment you know, into China, Southeast Asia, and so on. So overall, Japan's you know, declining uh, GDP share really doesn't represent the fact that Japan was still quite significantly influential and integrated in the region. If you look, uh, if you include the United States, obviously the shift is also quite visible where US's uh, GDP has uh, slightly, well, proportionally declined vis-a-vis -vis China. This is at the market exchange rate, but if you use the uh, purchasing power parity, China's GDP is actually uh, bigger than the United States. So the kind of receding US's influence, you know, obviously dramatically incre increasing uh, in China's influence, that put Japan in a very strategic position, which I would call a pivotal state, the position of pivotal state. 
I am not arguing really that Japan has the way to kind of shift the, the weight around between Japan, you know, China and the United States. That's not necessarily the kind of uh, uh, argument. While when it comes to making certain, establishing certain rules or order in the regional economy, Japan has a way to shift the, shift the kind of uh, trend towards certain ways. So that's what I call a uh, pivotal state, which was the publication I had with uh, Dr. Mireya Solis from uh, Brookings, University, uh, Brookings Institution in 2015. But anyway, the rivalry is as such that US want to push market liberalization, uh, some economic security, rules-based order, while China is pushing to expand its economy through state capitalism, some economic coercion, and clearly kind of a measure of, of uh, neo-mercantilism. So all in all, that's the kind of uh, big geoeconomic rivalry taking place. Japan actually is now in this pivotal uh, position to make the kind of which rules prevail over the uh, regional economic order. At the same time, though, you know, the question is, could Japanese, can Japanese government pull this off? And uh, domestic political economy really kind of uh, have a lot of indication as to why Japan is now taking this type of strategy, but also whether the implementation of it will be effective enough. And you know, this is not, this is still an evolving uh, prospect, but let me give three kind of indication of how the transformation of Japanese political economy has taken place and what kind of direction it's heading. The first one is the relationship with the government with the, and the private sector, especially the big businesses. As the economy matured uh, in Japan, and Japan was obviously, you know, Thomas Johnson's piece in 1982, that the Japan was the kind of uh, the, the, the prototypical developmental state where government actually Manage a lot of uh, economic uh, economic you know, kind of uh, direction, and the private sector actually followed or at least collaborated very closely, especially the big businesses. That day is all gone again, twenty well, already thirty years ago. While now private sector, especially the big businesses, successful businesses are much larger than the government, and also really has gotten significantly so called disembedded from the tutelage of the government. So this is one really uh, major maturing that took place in the context of Japanese political economy. The second point somewhat related is that Japanese firms are now much more of an investor, foreign investor, rather than just an exporter from Japan. So many of the items which Japan you know, bears the Japanese name, the Toyotas and then you know, kind of Panasonic and everything has now been manufactured outside of you know, significant component manufactured outside of Japan. And if you see this trend, you know, of, you know some of that you know, 60, 70, 80% of those productions are overseas. So in many ways, uh, the companies are worried a, a lot more about their protection of their assets overseas, intellectual property rights protection, you know, some of the environment, the legal and kind of a, a logistic environment that will make their investment safe and effective within the region. That was a very uh, significant part of this uh, regional strategy. Finally, when it comes to the implementation, sorry, implementation uh, structure that is the government and the bureaucracy and the, the politicians, uh, there has been a shift to here. It used to be that Japanese bureaucracy really, especially the economic bureaucracy guided the direction of Japanese foreign economic policy. Meanwhile, through the 1990s with the changes in the electoral law, uh, electoral reform, and also in the 2000 with the change with, through the administrative reform in, that kicked in in 2001, as well as later on under Prime Minister Abe, the civil service uh, reform in 2014, all of these reforms are putting a lot of weight and power in the hands of the, the leading pol politicians in the political party, as well as the, the uh, prime minister's office or the cabinet secretariat. So uh, there has been kind of a, a significant, well, there has been from the very significantly fragmented bureaucratic structure to be relatively um, streamlined structure and some politicians such leaders, political leaders, such as uh, Koizumi and, and Prime, just recent uh, Prime Minister Abe, managed to use this quite effectively 
in uh, creating and pushing for uh, effective uh, geoeconomic strategy uh, for Japan. So uh, let me wrap up and talk about the implications of what it mean, it all mean. <clears throat> for those who are interested in international relations, I have quite a bit of theoretical implications that my book has. One is uh, obviously one, one way of looking at systemic, systemic and domestic nexus, the systemic uh, kind of environment, the region, the geostrategy, uh, geo, geostrategy of China and United States where Japan fits, that gets uh, transmitted into the domestic kind of interest of the, the private sector as well as you know, kind of investor interest and also the, the structure. So that's what I like, I, I think I contribute by what contribute to that. Development state being matured is an interesting topic. Uh, I think a lot of interest is now reviving thinking about development of state and how we see the, that's continuing or kind of phasing out. And uh, there is a debate on that. And also interesting to think about how rules diffuse and Japan being a pivotal state. But uh, probably more interesting in this context of uh, East West Center talking about a lot of policy relevance is where Japan is heading and what does it mean. So for Japan, the opportunities are quite abundant and I would like to re-argue again that Japan is still the third largest economy in the world and it has a very strong kind of a opportunity and a role to play. So the precariousness, precariousness of international uh, liberal order and the geopolitics, that's the geostrategic uh, dynamics that's happening in the region really create this importance of rise of geoeconomic strategy. And this could really be a useful <clears throat> and economic statecraft being the uh, fore center of, of a lot of uh, the, the you know, instruments that's being used. Uh, so, you know, Japan is placed in a good place to, to implement these strategies as Japan has the, the power of pivotal state. Also, again, uh, it's interesting to see if the mature developmental state has you know, become, can become a strategic actor uh, along with, you know, in a way of shaping the regional and maybe even international economic order by playing a kind of a, a role in shifting from kind of a more protectionist mercantilist entity to become uh, liberalizers and, and those who um, abide by the rules of the international um, economic rule, economic game. While there are challenges, the roles are not just you know, only rosy, but uh, Japan still, Japan is, it, however you cut it, Japan's economic stagnation over the course of last 20 years is there. And when you look closely at the resource allocation, Japanese government financial, uh, sorry, fiscal resources are very limited. And that is that kind of put strains. So Japan could not do what it was able to do in the late 1970s, 1980s kind of, uh, or even 1990s, putting a lot of uh, government resources into these strategy. And also there is a continuing some of the bureaucratic uh, fragmentation going on. Meanwhile, it is true that Japanese government tries to has tried to entice private sector to help. And you know, obviously Japanese government is actually helping the private sector thrive while they want to have private sector come in to help the Japanese government strategy. But it is very difficult to control these private sector. Some of the private sectors are quite risk averse and they don't kind of uh, come with the government lead in the, the, the similar way that they used to in the 1970s and 1980s. So this is really putting a lot of challenge on Japan when, especially when it comes to infrastructure investment and things like that. And at the kind of a last point is that there is still an ambivalence in Japan's economic identity. I think there is still kind of a DNA still kind of uh, lurking in the background of the developmental state and some level of kind of a national, uh, uh, sorry, economic nationalism. So when it comes to hybrid, uh, hybrid strategy of the um, infrastructure investment and uh, now being pushed by the, the kind of major you know, expansion of BR uh, Belt and Road Initiative by the, by the Chinese government, there is an initiative to put all Japan kind of effort to do investment again in, uh, in, you know, in East Asia. Meanwhile, you know, obviously Japan 
try to differentiate itself for put, uh, putting forward the high standard and you know kind of the quality infrastructure, but still there is the level of uh, the government wants to kind of coordinate and push for its own uh, economic nationalism and, and uh, in, you know, kind of uh, interest for economic interest forward. So I would like to stop here and thank you for listening. I look forward to the question answer and discussion from Ellen. Wonderful, sorry. Thank you so much. Uh, Ellen, all yours. Yes, thank you very much. In the course of my long career, I can hardly think of a more um, significant highlight than being asked to share the platform with you, Professor Kavadis. <laughs> and thank you, Satu, for <clears throat> selecting me. When I was reading this marvelous book, uh, a personal anecdote came to mind. I was uh, active in the 1980s during the Japan bashing period in a number of business dialogues and corporate company to company discussions mostly held in Japan. Um, some between companies that had longstanding licensing relationships and some between industry associations. Um, and I remember vividly <clears throat> Um, hoping that we could align with some Japanese companies to identify common interests and then each of us would lobby our respective governments to bring about conditions that could ease some of this bashing. <clears throat> we had a meeting in a hotel. I don't think the Americans had uh, anyone from the embassy with them. Uh, the Japanese companies uh, have had reserved a conference room. A meaty guy arrived, went into the conference room, shut the door, <laughs> And after an hour, they came out with, guess what? The government's position. Um, and it was, <laughs> it was a clear example of, of what you defined in, in uh, the book as sort of your earlier starting point. And I was happy to see that uh, the Japanese companies, in your words, outgrew the need for government support and, and guidance, and uh, that the turn to the state-led liberal strategy was you know, quite real. But it was very frustrating to us to realize that, that that having businesses lobby the government independently was just not how it worked. Um, I think that this transition and the other transitions that you have documented so ably <clears throat> have um, quite broad implications beyond the ones you mentioned, um, particularly for the norms-based regional order more generally. I don't call it rules-based because there are very few rules that are enforceable outside of maybe the WTO, but so the norms-based economic um, order, uh, regional order in Asia, I think is going to be affected um, even more broadly than, than you have outlined. So I wanna make two points. <clears throat> the first point is, the first argument anyway, is that Japan's actions now are marked not by embedded um, mercantilism, but by embedded security concerns, broadly defined. I think this is a permanent change um, for Japan is no stranger to economic uh, security or strategic uh, issues going back decades. Food security, energy security in a resource poor country that's heavily mountainous. These have been preoccupations of the Japanese for many decades. But this is a broader kind of security concern. This is a uh, sort of geostrategic security concern that takes place in the context of the US-China rivalry that, that you mentioned. Um, several years ago, I, uh, I gave a speech here in Washington called Japan's Economic Statecraft in Asia, the best initiatives you've never heard of. And although this was a foreign policy audience, not a single one of them could identify what PQI stood for. Um, and I went on to talk about the Partnership for Quality Infrastructure, PQI, with an emphasis on the word quality. Um, because this is, again, one of these sort of implicit underlying symptoms of the rivalry with China. Chinese uh, projects in, at that time had been criticized for shoddy engineering, um, not to mention environmental destruction and stamping on the needs of the indigenous peoples and so forth. So partnership for quality initiative, Japanese being known for quality, um, in, whether it's car production or anything else, seemed to be an example of turning a, a very benign economic concept into something that could serve Japan's um, geo uh, security needs as well as uh, geoeconomic needs. So, I mean, I think this is, this is something of a permanent um, uh, shift. In the speech, I also went on to talk about Minister Abe, how he 
visited all 10 ASEAN countries in the first year of his second term, uh, how he introduced the notion of strategic criteria in the allocation of foreign aid. Uh, he he um, was clearly willing, as you said, to step up to the TPP and becoming the CPTPP. Uh, and there's just any number of um, examples um, of what Prime Minister Abe contributed to US and Japanese shared interests in the region in the context of China. And those of you who are listening who want more examples of this can look at the article by our mutual friend and Professor Katada's co-author, Maria Solis, in the current issue of Foreign Affairs, which is called um, Underest Underappreciated Power, Japan After Abe. And so Japan is finally getting the appreciation that it deserves, even if it, even if it may not want it. Um, the only criticism I would make, and this is more parenthetical, is that I think uh, the Japanese government should have participated in the AIIB. I think it was a huge mistake on our part, the US part, to try to persuade people not to join. Um, we could at least have applied for observer status, and I, I was only hoping that Japan would, would join the others, but that's rather minor in the greater scheme of things. Um, Another uh, sign of this change that I'm describing is that last April, uh, the Abe administration established a new economic statecraft division within the National Security Council or National Security Secretariat. It's the second largest uh, unit in the whole um, uh, organization. Uh, it's led, of course, by Métis, but it includes foreign affairs. It includes defense people and in intelligence people. Uh, and representatives of, of Japanese government, people who understand um, technology, uh, cyber, and all the rest of it. This again brings back a, a personal memory. Uh, I was in the Clinton administration's transition. At that time, there was an Office of International Economic Affairs within the US National Security Council. And uh, I very strongly wanted it to stay there and to expand uh, its size uh, so that economic and security issues were not stovepiped, but considered as a whole. Unfortunately, um, an advisor to President Clinton had already convinced him that to establish a separate National Economic Council, um, which was and is much weaker uh, and perpetuates that conceptual separation between economic and security issues. So <laughs> I lost that one, um, unfortunately. Um, but uh, Japanese have done exactly the right thing, as far as I can see. So the second point I want to make is uh, sort of an observation as I read the book. Um, there are, in fact, a number of parallels between the evolution of um, Japan's regional uh, strategy and, and its evolution of defense policy. There are some real parallels here that's kind of interesting. For example, um, Japan has gone from a passive follower of the United States into acquiring more of a leadership role. Um, whether or not it reflects hardcore military capabilities may be debatable, but nevertheless, Japan has been willing to step forward and participate with others um, in a number of um, joint uh, exercises and the like. Similarly, from bilateral to regional, plurilateral, um, or uh, activities. Japan has also um, embraced those, a number of them. Uh, again, joint exercises and dialogues and that kind of thing. Um, there, there is in the security realm the same kind of embrace of the free and open um, Indo-Pacific vision. Free and open, incidentally, goes way back to the APEC first head of state summit in 1993, where APEC leaders pledged to create a free and open Asia Pacific, a free and open trade and investment in the Asia Pacific. Uh, and that was reaffirmed the next year in Bog Bogo, Indonesia. Um, so now the free and open has taken on, again, a broader uh, phrase, not just trade and investment, but freedom from hegemony by an outside power and so forth. Um, so that's another roughly rough parallel. Um, defense um, activities have gone from informal, low key, measures to more formal and more visible um, measures, I, I would argue. Um, more power uh, in this area is concentrated in the prime minister's office, just as it is in the economic realm, to get these 
warring bureaucracies uh, more closely coordinated. I often say that the farther away you are from a foreign capital, the more you think they have a grand strategy, capital S, and it's all very smooth. But in fact, your book illuminates brilliantly all of the domestic interests and the push and the pull inside out, as you said, how these domestic political economy factors influence the region and how the region in turn uh, influences the evolution of domestic um, institutions and politics and so forth. So that's, that happens also, I, I would argue, in the defense area. Um, so um, all in all, um, I think Japan has emerged as a much more uh, visible leader uh, within constitutional constraints, within the constraints of public opinion in Japan. I think there's a great deal more leadership now. And I believe that at least in the medium to long term, um, these changes are going to stay in place. Uh, under Prime Minister Suga or anyone else who succeeds him. So I'll just end with a, a, a pro promo for the book. For those of you listening, uh, there are 100 pages of footnotes in Japanese and English reflecting incredible research, less than 200 pages of text with not a single word wasted, very, very clear. And in case you were lost in the acronyms on the PowerPoint slides, there's a very useful long list of acronyms so it's a, it's a pleasure to have read the book and it's a pleasure to be on the same platform with you, Sally. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Ellen. That was uh, terrific uh, by taking the issue of uh, Japan's geoeconomic strategy into a wider and, and making a mm -hmm. parallel with Japan's uh, diplomatic and defense uh, approach as well. I think that really rounds it out and it was great to have both of you therefore on the panel. Um, we are, uh, of course, uh, getting questions in, and so I would invite those now, and I will read them simply because our YouTube live guests are not able to see the questions, and um, therefore um, I will read them out and then pass them along. But as we're waiting for them to develop, I'll just flag a couple things. First, in the chat section, we have put a link to Sauri's book and to the article that was referenced by uh, our Brookings colleague, Maria Solis. Uh, in foreign affairs. So there are a couple of links there. Please feel free to, to click on those to get further information on ordering uh, Sari's book, et cetera. I have a couple of questions as we wait, as I said, um, and I welcome both of your comments, but um, um, here they go. The first thing I found quite fascinating and quite natural, but in a way fascinating is um, I think quite underappreciated is the changing nature of de Japan's domestic political economy mm -hmm. as a driver for this changing geoeconomic strategy, particularly emphasizing formal agreements, as you said, a rule-based or uh, you know uh, structured uh, environment. So, brags a couple of questions. Um, one is um, demography in the Japanese domestic political economy. What implications, if any, uh, I mean, the current policies are reflecting the changes quite right, but now we're looking at some changes that could affect the domestic political economy further. And one of them is clearly dem demography. So I'd like to know a little bit more about what role, if any, you see, or is demography just a, dependent uh, variable of the domestic political economic changes. Uh, the other questions I have are a little bit broader. Japan, in a way, came to economic power. Um, my, this is my own view. I don't want to put it on anyone else. But I've always been impressed that Japan's role in Asia really arrived in the 80s after Plaza when Japanese yen went through the roof and Japan was this juggernaut of economic power. Remember all the lead goose of the flying geese and Japan was, you know, let's face it. I mean, whatever the World Bank says about Asia and, and, and the economic miracle, one element of that quote miracle was Japanese financing and Japanese uh, assistance to the development of, of the regional economies, particularly Thailand and Malaysia. Uh, but also Taiwan and elsewhere. So now those economies don't require that much assistance. They are now integrated, as you said, into East Asia, but also globally. And I wondered if your, your view of Japan's role 
is now different in those economies? Is it now a production base? Because as you said, you showed the chart from the cabinet office showing you know, production moving offshore. And my final question sort of point is, Japan is now in an age where there is a real tussle for decoupling between the US and China. Uh, and how can Japan maintain its normative, rules-based, globalized, liberal approach when certain drivers are pushing in the other direction for decoupling, for reshoring, for creating separate digital universes? Uh, what happens to Japan under this environment? Because um, it's an ally and that kind of tests and I'd love to hear Ellen too on this because it tests Japan's defense posture too. Because whatever else it's doing proactively on defense, it's still a US ally. And so it's gonna be asked to align on certain elements of that decoupling or PRC economic statecraft. So those are some thoughts as, as we wait for other. So maybe uh, start with Saori and then turn to Ellen. And uh, I'm conscious that we have about uh, 12 minutes, please. Yeah, well, thank you very much. First, thank you, Ellen, for your kind words. I mean, somebody you know, getting that kind of words and you know, compliment from somebody who I respect so much is so uh, so uh, flattering to me and very honored. Um, just kind of take the point about this economic security parallel or economic security kind of a, a you know issue. I think both both of your questions kind of uh, allude to. You know, overall, my sense is that uh, there has always been, in the context of East Asia, the, the overlap or kind of a merging of economic and security issues. Mm. And a lot of economic instruments and the kind of uh, uh, economic uh, objectives, goals, and security goals have blurred in many ways. And you know, maybe uh, case in point is that a lot of economic sta statecraft is a better instrument for many of these economies to get at each other uh, rather than, again, you know, sending missiles. So whatever the kind of you know, real security that yeah, using security instruments. So you know, for Japan, that has been the comprehensive uh, security concept and, and many of that. So. Altogether, I think that that becomes much more explicit these days because of um, of you know some kind of tension and and you know things kind of coming up, and I I would think that you know that's that's you no know, part of it. So um, using kind of a security rationale for economic interaction is also kind of kind of flip side of it in the sense of now it has become the, the kind of economic objective has also been you know kind of securitized so i think that overall kind of blending or the the merger is really what we see in this region and this is you know, kind of a, a kind of a way to kind of a picture that that would remain uh remain very important so that's my kind of take on what you've commented uh, in terms of uh, Satu's point about demography, I mean, demography is really critical for Japan. And, you know, Japan has, it's, it's the demography, uh, the, it's the uh, population declining. Uh, Japan is very reluctant, even though, you know, Prime Minister Abe kind of started to have more foreign workers coming into Japan. And, you know, if compared to, you know, five, 10 years ago, there has been more workers from uh, abroad working in Japan. But at the same time, it's not going to be a, you know, another kind of boom of uh, population growing and it's aging and so on and so forth. So that's precisely the foundation. I probably didn't uh, explicitly talk about it as much in my book, but it's the foundation of Japan needing the region overall. So for the market, for the workers and for investment opportunities and all that, Japan is looking to the region, not just in Japan, but going beyond because the, economy, the the overall the population is shrinking and and there is still a significant financial resources not in the hands of the government but in the hands of the private sector so japan is still you know one of the largest creditors in the world and that will continue for uh, quite a while thus it's important for the government to really put this economic environment in the region that will be amicable and hospitable and safe for Japanese investment uh, around, the, around the region, especially, but beyond. Um, in terms of the, the Plaza Accord, 
actually, you know, Japan has had this mind kind of of integrating the region back in 1930s. Uh, you know, that's a kind of a, you know, um, um, what do you call it, uh, kind of uncomfortable history. But all this flying beast pattern was already uh, uh, envisioned by uh, uh, Professor Akamatsu, who is a scholar from 1930s to 1960s, 70s. So uh, that was, you know, obviously in the most contemporary round that kind of became implemented since 1985, where, you know, Prabhu and, and Endaka and everything kind of pushed Japanese investment. Uh, not only that, but as well as the protectionist in the US, protectionism in the US uh, kind of made Japanese uh, companies to go abroad to produce and, and so on and so forth. So in some ways, you know, that's happening. How much of this is being, um, how, how it is, um, received by other countries. I was just looking uh, into this because TJ Pimpel who commented on my book kind of talked about how is it being, you know, um, how do you call it, uh, positively received by other countries. And and actually the ASEAN uh, does, uh, ISIS is one of the institute in uh, Singapore, does a opinion, elite opinion poll every year. And Japan really scores really high in that realm. And yeah. especially a majority of the elites who see Japan very favorably basically says Japan is an entity that abide by the rules of the game and provide a kind of rule-based order or maybe norm-based order in the region. And so in some ways, to some extent, maybe it's a, a slow going, but it's working in terms of how others respond to Japan's initiative in the last at least, you know, kind of a, a decade or so. So I'll make it very quick. Give the floor to Ellen. <laughs> I'm sorry, are you finished? Yeah. yeah. You're, okay. I'll make a very quick comment. So, too, in response to your question, what happens to Japan in the context of decoupling? Um, very quickly, I, I'd make two points. One is I'm really quite skeptical about how far decoupling can and will go. There are companies, including US companies, that choose to stay in China to serve the huge market at the price of facing restrictions um, from the United States and, and other things. Uh, I think some relationships are so intricately tangled and interdependent that they would be hard to sever. And so I think the reshoring ideas is uh, overblown. I think the companies would rather go to Southeast Asia than go back to Japan, uh, partly for cost reasons. So I think decoupling is a little bit hyped. And the other comment I'd make is really, um, it depends on how significant the pushback against China becomes. You could, you know, Chinese are not dumb. I mean, they have been probing the limits and, and so far they've gotten away with pretty much everything. Um, but if the pushback gets strong enough and the Chinese learn that they're losing influence in the region because of their behavior, I think they might very well um, uh, dial back some of the things they've been doing. I think that in, if they have hopes for a Biden administration, they are maybe mistaken because I think this, toughness towards China and doing something about China is, has bipartisan support, including from Biden, who does not want to be thought of as you know, soft on Beijing and so forth. So I, that, that would be um, my, my answer. I, I think it, uh, it depends somewhat. Well, it's, it's another example of Professor Katata's inside out, outside in, that the, um, the domestic calculations of Japanese companies will influence the outcome and then the the Chinese response to the pushback will in turn influence the um, things back in Japan. That's very helpful. Let me uh, just on that note, uh, ping uh, Sauri a little bit more on this. Just to, and I quite agree, Ellen, I, I raised the issue because I wanted to hear a little bit more from Sauri on this issue about how Japan uh, navigates this decoupling or this tension, because it, whether it's less or more, Mm -hmm. uh, we heard in recent interviews for a report we're writing on regional responses to current U.S. policy, Asia policy, uh, a lot of angst and anxiety in the region, including Japan, about being put in incredibly uncomfortable positions about technology. On the one hand, uh, you know, this decoupling creates a lot of uh, headwinds for them, uh, makes rulemaking harder, makes negotiating harder. On the other hand, there are some areas of pushback against PRC economic statecraft, high technology, uh, 5G, Huawei, et cetera, which are concerns on the part of Canberra or Seoul or Singapore or Tokyo with, with or without US product. In other words, there's concerns there too. 
So I guess the question for Saori is, in this new active rule-based liberal approach of Japan, how do you, how much bandwidth is there to accommodate China? Uh, how, how do you cut a deal with China, which is also compare a relatively wants to turn inward, relatively wants to end uh, increase domestic consumption, uh, develop technology on its own because of the uh, U.S. approach that's going to remain. To, I mean, wh where's the balance? You, we were talking before the session formally started about, you know, uh, Abe raising the prospect of um, joint projects between China and Japan on BRI or infrastructure. Let's not call it BRI, but you know, infra uh, infrastructure need. How much bandwidth is there in this geo strategy for accommodating and working with China? Well, that's you no, know, that's the million dollar question, I think. So. For Japan, decoupling from China is not an option, really. Mm. Uh, not only because it's geographically there, that's obviously the first point, but Japanese economy is now very significantly integrated into that of, of China and you know, many of the relation, uh, the kind of a, a dynamics of relations and institutions and so on are all quite entangled you know, or enmeshed in, in many ways. So um, in the kind of way of you know, US saying, no, goodbye, this is it, and you know, I, I don't think it'll happen. I agree with Ellen that I don't think that will happen. But even as a rhetoric, I think that's not really an, an option to do. Then the question, and also, yes, Japan can kind of use use this kind of anxiety on the part of many, you know, Southeast Asia and all the places of uh, China's rise and its behavior and so on and so forth to say, you know, I am the better guy than, than China, please trust us and not, not them, which, you know, which Japan is quite, you know, uh, Prime Minister Abe, I think did pretty well in the last, you know, last almost eight years. While at the same time, actually Japan's role is to work with China so that China will start behaving better and the region will be stable and China will benefit and the rest of the, the, the you know, kind of economies around China would not have to worry too much about China acting up this way. I'm not sure if Japan has that power alone usually, you know, especially that if the US is not backing Japan to carry this forward. I, I really would hope that US is still continue to engage with the, you know, to help Japan and other countries, not only Japan, but, you know, South Korea could be one, Taiwan, well, I don't know, Taiwan is a precarious position, but Singapore could be one, you know, even Vietnam could be one. But to, again, enmesh China in such a way that it will be, you know, kind of a Chinese you know, uh, uh, favorite phrase of win-win for the region. So, yes, I, you know, again, you know, decoupling is probably overblown, uh, at this point, you know, for Japan, decoupling is almost impossible. And for the US, I think it's still very, very difficult and it will be partial if any, but at the same time, yes, managing China going forward is difficult. My wishful thinking, and I think it's a wishful thinking and you know, those who are very critical of China would probably criticize me for this is that China still knows too, that it's a maturing developmental state that it be, it's the way that they are now you know, shifting money around and all that would not continue forever. They cannot go into this dead, you know, so-called dead trap diplomacy, which I don't think is intentional, but you know, they, they have all the money. I mean, you know, they need some of that back. They actually need to have a productive investment and so on and so forth. So for them in the long run, rule-based order, the kind of law based order, and the way to protect their investment abroad is important. And, you know, you cannot be sh shipping their gunboat to collect debt anymore. Then I guess the rules are the, the second best, or well, second best, or the best option, actually, to really manage the thriving economy moving forward. So that's my kind of uh, optimistic view. If that's the case, then maybe could you ever foresee China joining CPTPP? They actually talk pretty positively about it. Yeah. I mean, they talked a little bit, they hinted about earlier TPP, you know, whether that was real or reformers or just a little bit of trying to figure out what it was. But I mean, it, that would put us in a, us, it would put the United States in a difficult position if China said, we'll abide by CPTPP rules if um, the US is out, right? 
Well, they actually, the, in the Obama administration, there were a couple of official statements from the NFC that, that they would be open to possible Chinese membership in a second round. Vietnam, you know, joined and got in by virtue of massive commitments to reform its economy. Mm. And China would have to do the same and its record, you know, would have to be judged by other members who would then vote on the application. But in, in general, I think it would be a good thing. Just a very quick note, I, I agree that um, this debt trap diplomacy has been uh, exaggerated. I mean, the again, the Chinese learn, Chinese companies don't particularly want to take over you know, rusty and aging, um, underutilized parts. <laughs> what do they want with, to do with those things? So uh, um, now um, the IMF is likely to be brought in on consultations in partnership with the Chinese. Uh, there's very careful attention paid now to the financial uh, position of the recipient government. So I, I think despite Hamban Toda, I think, I think the debt trap diplomacy uh, canard ought to be put aside. Well, we have come, alas, unfortunately, to the end of our time because I could learn from uh, Dr. Katada and uh, Dr. Frost for a long time to come, but I thank you. It's a Friday afternoon. I'm conscious of that, mid-afternoon. Many of us are working from home, uh, so I, I really do appreciate people participating. But as you can see, um, we have had wonderful fellows here like Professor Katada, and thank you for bringing your book uh, to our attention so that we could have this in our 60 Minutes for the 60th series, Sorry, It's really great. And we always, we always have a home here and look forward to having your next book uh, launch here. I, you may not want to think about your next book right away, <laughs> but, uh, but we always welcome you. And there it is. And as I uh, said again, the link uh, to order is uh, in the chat function. And Ellen, as always, wonderful to hear from you and to have your great insights. So I do uh, wish to call this to a close. Um, I wish everyone safety and health and happiness during these difficult times. And we look forward to engaging with you in future East West Center programs. So be well, be safe, and thank you very much. Again, thank you, Satu. Yeah, Bye. thank you, Satu, and thank you, Ellen. Look forward uh, we'll to getting you. together with you, Salary, whenever it's possible. Yeah, yeah. We'll see you soon. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.